Welcome to the Zach's Quarterly Market Strategy Conference Call, a service of Zach's Professional Services Division. For first-time attendees, this is a live conference call that features Zach's strategists providing their analysis of the latest issues and trends affecting investors, the market, and the economy, both globally, including here in the United States. Joining us as panelists today are Zach's Chief Equity Strategist and Economist John Blank with his focus on the race for a COVID-19 vaccine and its effect on the upcoming presidential election. And Zach's Research Director Shiraz Meehan with a look at the Q3 earnings season that's underway, as well as earnings expectations for year-end and beyond. By the way, if you have any questions for either of them, you can always type them in the message field at the right of your screen. We'll get to as many as we have time for. So, John, let's start with you. There hasn't been great news so far this week on the COVID front. What can you share with us as the markets currently try to balance COVID vaccine concerns with other fundamentals? Well, Terry, I'm going to go straight ahead into my slides. And for some reason, I'm not, there we go. Okay, so what I want to do in this presentation is I've got five parts. You can see my five parts. Vaccines by the numbers, the five vaccine platforms, the 11 COVID treatment and vaccine stocks that matter. And then if I have time, I'll get into the big picture of where we are with this global COVID moment, but I certainly will get to uh, the US election. So obviously I've got 50 slides. We're not gonna get through those today in my 25 minutes or so. So what we're going to do is hopefully get all of you to look into the slides and look into my market strategy report, which contains a lot of the links to the articles, because this is such an important subject and is going to change so dramatically over the next six months. But the basic point of doing the 21 coronavirus vaccine race now is the Fed is out of the way till 2023. We all know that. The Fed is done with their ammunition. We don't know much about the stimulus, but we do know that the vaccine will take care of stimulus if it happens and it works. So. At the end of the day, this recovery, because it was a public health suppression on the way in, will be a public health recovery. And none of us, including me, have ever seen anything like this. So that's what my talk is today. It's, it's a dynamic talk. It's one I've done in writing of articles over the last three months or so. I've been collecting more and more information as I understand it and putting it together, and I'll keep doing that. So what you're seeing today is what I've learned. And to start with, it's just an amazing tale, and you have to appreciate this concept called Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed is the Trump administration's program. Moncleff Slough is the guy, he's a pharma executive who's in charge of it. You have to also understand Operation Warp Speed sounds like a Defense Department program because it is. The De Defense Secretary Esper and a general are combining with drug administrators to get Operation Warp Speed together. And as you can see, the project aims to deliver 300 million doses of any vaccine starting in January 2021, which is, by the way, three months from now. None of the four candidates to enter phase three trials have yet publicly reported data from the mid stage. So, warp speed's warp speed, right? We're talking. Just an incredible thing. However, they really are looking for 80 to 90% efficacies of these vaccinations, which is astonishing. Do I believe any of this? Um, I, I don't know what I believe. I think that's the point here is I, I can only share with you this information. We can begin to track it and get ourselves more and more confident. But the guys who are going to make money in this market with this type of recovery are those who start the process of learning of what's going on. So for example, the next timeline this gentleman has is between November and January, 80 to 100 million people, the elderly healthcare workers and the first line workers will start the vaccination process, right? And this is gonna happen right after the election. You're probably gonna get emergency authorizations from Operation Warp Speed around Thanksgiving. And this is gonna kick off very quickly. 
everything in this market is going to change very quickly. Now, the other thing to go to note I've learned is Operation Warp Speed, if you go to hhs.gov, you can find a fact sheet on Operation Warp Speed. So it's called Fact Sheet Explaining Operation Warp Speed. What's the goal? How will the goal be accomplished? What's the plan? What's happened so far, et cetera, and so forth. This is going to keep track of this whole Operation Warp Speed for you. It also has something I will not cover today, which is the distribution partners. McKesson, for example, is already lined up to be a distribution partner. So what you're gonna learn today is there's basically this incredibly fast timeline, probably unrealistic. There's the markets timeline, which is kind of in the middle. And then there's the rest of the world's timeline, which is probably at the end of this year. 2021's end, 12 months from now. So what the market thinks is the next thing I'm going to stop in, which is I'll take UBS as an example of the market. They think that basically only half of the vaccine hope is priced in. And approved vaccine should lift mobility to normal. And it will be a tactical one-off rise in the market. So when is this going to happen? Good luck figuring that out. But this is the idea that the market thinks only half of the vaccine upside is priced in and it will go up. Now, the other thing to learn here, a lot of people, I put out articles too about this, is the vaccine candidates as companies. And what I've learned is, by and large, you're gonna get 2 billion vaccines, maybe. Certainly not gonna come from one place. Three to four dollars a vaccine, that's $8 billion, $12 billion. It's not going to create a huge windfall for a company. So the vaccine upside here is not a actual company. In fact, the shorts, the hedge fund shorts are on Innovio and Moderna because they are the standalone vaccine players. And a lot of people think because of those vaccine operation war three is totally gonna miss some of the negatives of these vaccines. The way to make money is to short those stocks. So be very careful about underthinking the vaccine upside. It is not to buy the 11 stocks that we're talking about today. That may not work at all. It will be about the rise in mobility that will come from the vaccine being successful in the population. So it's a visible, trackable, external thing if the vaccine works because we'll see it in the mobility of the society. That will be the ultimate metric of efficacy in this situation. So that's the second thing I've stopped at. I've already gotten you through Operation Warp Speed. Now I'm taking you through the upside of the price stand. And then the third one will be this idea of where the upside's coming from. And I, this is just basically changing non-farm payroll losses since February. So when the mobility comes back, the plays you're looking for from a stock investor perspective, obviously number one, and it's more upside than anywhere else is the restaurants, the hotels and entertainment. So focus on that. Number two, the energy play, right? There's gonna be a big energy play if this thing gets fixed. Number three, film, television and publishing is really hammered because you can't actually do these things. I think there's a huge change underway in film, television, and publishing. Very much worth thinking about. Education, teachers can't go to work. A lot of them have given up. So again, big plays if something goes on there. And you can look, these are the real main areas, and these are the good magnitudes of where you should focus on for these mobility plays when we get there. So Goldman says, when we get there, 40% of people, you can see, we'll take this vaccine. The other 60% are kind of like, well, we'll see. You know, but a third of the people are not sure and the other third are not gonna do it. Now, this is pretty stable over the last few year, months. So what, what's, what can we learn here? Well, again, back to Operation Warp Speed, nobody's ever tried to approve a novel vaccine, distribute a novel vaccine and have it work in seven or eight or 10 months. So I think people are actually, I started out thinking about this and saying, oh, we get a lot of political moves here. But I actually think this is a rational way to think about 
moving so quickly on a thing you don't know about that might actually hurt you. So I think, you know, you've got to give people a little more credit here. And at this point in time, until we know more, this is probably a you know, pretty rational way to look at it. Okay, but the United States, the third way to think about the vaccines is in the international context. And if you think, you know, acceptance of the vaccine in the population will drive mobility up. Because at the end of the day, it's not science. It'll be you taking the vaccine in mass numbers so the mobility goes up. Then we're actually kind of, we're kind of weak, right? We're definitely below the world number there. It's in the middle. In places like Japan, Canada, Australia, UK, India, Brazil, China, probably going to get ahead of us because they're going to take the vaccine quicker. So this is the picture of the two industries that are basically being employed to put this vaccine together. The blue line is the biomedical group and the green line is the large cap pharmas. And this is their stock industry group charts. And they pretty much align with one another. You can see the big pull down in March and the recovery quickly in April and May and June. But what you should also notice is neither picture is bullish. It's just a recovery from a, from a repression. There is no upside here in this whole picture. So what this is telling you is, like I said, the market doesn't either A, price it in on the drugs and bios particularly, and I also don't see these as being the opportunity. And I think that's correct. If you think too simplistically that buying the drug or bio comp stock that puts out the vaccine is gonna work, I think you're crazy because Part of what's happened already through Operation Warp Speed is they've all got contracts for 100 million doses and an upside from there if it works, and the manufacturing facility is already getting built. So basically, it's a public good, and you're going to be very hard pressed as a successful vaccine maker, US or non US, to not just get this thing out everywhere and all these governments putting pressure and you get it out at a reasonable price. So it's just going to be very hard to get the business to work on a very one-off, straightforward way. You're better off looking for the mobility place. And this is uh, the, the whole story of the stock market relative to that prior story that I showed you. For, so for here, we got a range-traded set of industries. Here, we got a market that's hitting new highs. So what's different here? Obviously, it's the tech growth stocks, right? And that has been the driving force, that and the mega caps, on the stock market overall. So the market at this point is not in the 2021 vaccine mentality. And this can be something they drive stocks sideways because if you think about what's gonna happen, people will take money out of these tech stocks and rotate them. So what can happen then is this trade starts to go sideways for a period of time. And I don't think you get bearish, but I do think you get sideways momentum and i've kept my 31 400 s p target for the end of the year because i think once the election's out of the way hopefully it gets out of the way in a non-contested way this vaccine story picks up the emergency authorizations start happening and the market starts to rotate and this could just take people out of profitable stocks and into these other areas so this is where we're at according to the who on october the 6th there are 193 vaccines under trial, 193, 42 are in advanced stages. So what's one in one in four, one in five? And again, one in four and five of five are in phase three efficacy. They give the vaccine to thousands of people and wait to see how many become infected compared to volunteers who receive a placebo. So basically, you go out and get COVID, and you know, obviously, another group doesn't, and they see how many, how how well it works. So, um, ten of these are in phase three. I'm going to go through eleven of the stocks. So some of those are treatment stocks, some of these are other stocks. But the basic point is, it's be very hard to just bet on the first wave of these ten. Obviously, the warp speed scientists are trying their best to pick these up. The pharma executives are trying their best to get it right. 
but there will be learning and there will be later stage candidates that might have better efficacy because of the learning that's going on here. So impossible to know how this plays out, but a very murky situation. And this is uh, a really key chart that, that Bernstein put together about this whole thing. And it gives you the timelines. And again, here the market's betting somewhere 2Q21. And it goes through the vaccines in the first thing, and then what's called the neutralizing antibodies. President Trump took one from Regeneron, and you can see that was year end 20, and he got back on the campaign trail. So Lilly had another one that got detracted or sidetracked just a few days ago. There's things that Vera and Amgen are also similar. So the neutralizing antibodies, uh, treatments and testing can all front run the vaccines and they are going on too. So it is not necessarily the case that the vaccine will be the end game. So again, focus on the stock, probably not it. You can get the mobility call right out of a neutralizing antibody or a, a fast testing phase that just gets super aggressive after the election with a different government. So there's plenty of ways to get 21 to recover absent an effective vaccine. So it's not necessarily the case that you should focus on when the vaccine is going to work and when it's not, because all kinds of other things will be happening. So World Health Organization has this group called COVAX, C-O-V-A-X. And like the Climate Change Accords, pretty much everybody's in COVAX, but the United States in five random countries. So why don't we join COVAX? Because um, it's part of the, run by the WHO and, and we've, we've, you know, we're, we're out of this whole idea, this is deep state stuff, so not do this, but everybody else is in. And they think, this group thinks by the end of 2021, they'll get the first 2 billion doses to all countries participating. Now, this gets us into the next thing, which is China and Russia are out there and they're actually in front of us. The Russian vaccine is called Sputnik 5. The Sputnik, if you recall, was the first satellite in orbit that started the space race. So Sputnik 5 is their national science push to get this done. And China, as we'll learn, has got a number of vaccines too. So this is the other thing to keep on in track of. And this takes us to this idea of the world being divided into vaccine blocks. Um, this chart I could spend a ton of time on just alone. It, don't skip it, don't go away from it too quickly. For example, notice there's a, a Thai vaccine. There's an Iranian vaccine. China's got four, look at the names. Can Sino Bio, you probably heard about. Sinovac, CNBG, Sinopharm, and Wallvax, you probably haven't. There's the Russian Sputnik V, and then you can see all the different US, Europe ones. But what you should learn from this picture um, is this vaccine race will probably be setting up the geopolitics of the world for some time to come. Because these are governments buying vaccines from each other and working together. And so you can see effectively what groups trust whom. And surprisingly, the United States, Australia, India, South Africa, and Western Europe are kind of a block. Then there's China, Thailand, Burma, Pakistan, some of the reached the Islamic countries, and some penetration of South America. And then there's Russia, who surprisingly has some appeal to the Mexicans who don't trust us anymore to some other uh, parts of the Islamic world, which are not entirely comparable, just tie, dealing with the Chinese. And you have a picture of the world's geopolitics. And this is probably the other hidden story is, we're learning who trusts whom and who's gonna learn to cooperate from the vaccine story. This, for example, is just what we saw in the last week. Sao Paulo with Sinovac, Russia with Egypt, Russia with Uzbekistan, AstraZeneca, which is a UK company with Canada, and Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline with Canada. So people are playing this hand. And this takes me into this next set of slides called the vaccine platforms. And this is fascinating. Part of warp speed is to try novel ways 
to find a vaccine for a novel virus. So for example, one of the things that may happen here is the COVID vaccine may be sprayed into your nose or inhaled. It may not require needles. Um, and if you look at what these vaccines platforms are, what's interesting is this is not going to be your dead virus, you know, injection necessarily. It might be, but a lot of these things are using pieces of DNA or messenger RNA, mRNA, or an add vector, meaning just a piece of it or a subunit of the DNA, or what's called RVSB, which is basically the Ebola vaccines that are being repurposed. So I'm going to not be able to get through all of this today, but just to show you how this works, I've got mRNA being the first of its kind. It would be the first mRNA vaccine in the world. So no one has ever licensed this for an infectious disease, and that is the Moderna play. Add vectors. This is the University of Oxford thing. So what this is, is you get the genetic sequence of it, put it out to three different groups, and then figure out how to do this. But here's a look at this line. Adenovirus vectors are the new vaccine front runners. Can they overcome their checkered past? Meaning they've got problems. Subunits. Subunits are pieces of, you know, you can read recombinant, polysaccharide, and conjoint vaccines. So specific pieces of the germs, like it's protein, sugar, or capsid, the casing or antigen. So these, again, are not the vaccine of the virus, but some piece of it. So that's why it's obviously called a subunit. And the DNA one is just taking the actual strand of gen genetic material. And this gets into the Merck idea, which is the Ebola strategy. So I'm gonna skip this next piece. I've got it in my Marcus Rad report, but you can go through all these different players and take a look at their stories and what's going on. And this is fascinating reading, and you're gonna get to all this stuff, including these neutralizing antibodies, which are not vaccines. This is just an antibody that can neutralize the effects of the vaccine. So you don't get rid of the virus, but you neutralize it. And this is actually what Trump did with Regeneron. So all this stuff can work quite well. And the fourth and final piece is the rapid vaccine mass testing. And this can basically be incredibly effective. Remember, here's an example of how the US is doing this now. We had 34 cases in the White House, the White House, but we did not do any testing because they refused to do testing at the White House level. So how does China do this differently? They had nine cases recently in Quindao, and they rolled out a test of nine million people in Quindao in five days to get it back together. So how you handle this without a vaccine, without any of the neutralizing antibodies, is you test everybody in five days and get back to normal and just knock out the folks that have it. So that's the other thing that's gonna happen here is mass testing in a new administration, if we have one, is gonna be the big killer app. It's already here. All you gotta do is talk to the Chinese and talk to the pharma companies, get it going. So I'm gonna skip this other piece. This is the COVID update. Uh, it's interesting material, but I don't have time for it. And I'm going to go all the way to the back of my slides and effects on the coming presidential election. So this is where I'll wrap it up for my part. And what I want to make the point of is everybody's worried about this election being another Clinton-Trump thing where Trump comes out of the blue and wins anyways, based, basically runs over the polls. So what I'm going to show you is the polls across the entire 12 months in advance of the Clinton period and Trump campaigns to the 2020 election. I'm gonna show you something you already learned today, which is the coronavirus changed everything. It is the dominant effect on the polling, and it is the reason things are going to not be like the Clinton period. So take a look. There's the Clinton-Trump polling numbers 
over 2016 running into the election. The key point to make is Trump was ahead, marginally ahead, at least three and possibly four times. You can see four spikes of interest and you can see movement from the mid 30s to the mid 40s, a full 10% of the population swung back and forth in 2016. There is 2020. Let's go through this again. There is 2016. There is 2020. There is 2016. There is 2020. What you see is totally different. Biden's driving up. There is no uncertainty and there is no spiking. So recency bias is completely foreshadowed something that's not happening. Biden's going to win. He's going to win a landslide. 10 point advantage. Uh, and it's not like Clinton. That's what the polls are showing us. So one of the things to do is to realize the market's already priced this in, and this is already a given as far as the market's concerned. So that leads us to the final slide before I end of the Shiraz, which is the scenario analysis Goldman Sachs itself has. Their expected policy is for a democratic sweep. That will leave the S&P 500 at 3,400. Just my target too. So I, I, what I'm saying when I say 3,400 in the S&P for the end of the year, is that basically the market starts to realize, ah, it's happening, this rotation's happened. So you take out the upside and the tech size to start rotating the vaccines and the fiscal stimulus. Basically the market goes sideways and then starts picking up again. By the middle of 2021, you're up to 3,800. Divided Congress, actually they're a little more bullish. They think you'll get, a little stronger lift out of the market because you won't get as easy ability to tax increase things. And you'll actually get to an even higher um, S&P 500, 4,000. Their negative case is the contested election and they think it'll get 3,100. So obviously right now, if these are the three scenarios you think are gonna happen, you wait it out and make sure the contested election doesn't happen because that's a big 300 point or 10% drop if we're getting into a contested election. Nobody knows if that's going to happen or not. The bottom line of Zach's call, my call, is priced in. It is the base case. And it, it, it relies upon the idea that Biden is just going to sweep across the United States in a historic landslide election. That's what the polls say. And that has to be your base case. So with that, I'll hand it over to Terry and Shiraz and let, I'll let you go from here. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, let me get into my slide. Uh, so my goal here will be to give you a sense of the uh, the big picture, uh, lay off the land in terms of earnings, how we reached here, where we are, uh, and what current expectations tell us about year end and 2021, uh, and how to uh, evaluate or look up uh, uh, those expectations uh, in the different uh, macro uh, scenario that uh, John uh, explained to us uh, in, in the earlier segment. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, here's the, the big picture annual view. Uh, and you could see I have highlighted uh, what's currently uh, expected for 2020, uh, the 20.2% decline in earnings for S&P 500 on 4.7% decline in revenues. Uh, if you look back, uh, 2018 was the big uh, tax cut driven boost in earnings. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, we stayed in place essentially flat. And the hope while we were going through 2019 was for a double digit gain uh, in 2020. Uh, but of course, uh, then COVID happened and uh, that's where we are now. But if you look ahead, 
the expectation is uh, for a very strong rebound next year uh, and beyond. So uh, continuing with this annual view, uh, I do want you to keep in mind as regular readers of my earnings commentary, you know already the outlook did start improving towards the middle of the year. We saw from early July uh, that not only the tone and substance of management commentary about trends and business conditions changed, uh, but that started showing up in estimates as well. Obviously, that was a reflection of how the recovery has started unfolding. So the 20.2% decline in earnings that I showed you in the previous slide is actually an improvement from uh, a little over 24% decline uh, that was expected uh, at mid-year point. So what we are showing here visually is to, uh, uh, is to, uh, to, to give you a sense of what the COVID impact on this corporate earnings story has been. If you can see here, uh, the 2018-2019, we got a huge boost, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from the tax cut legislation. Uh, but COVID has essentially taken us back to the 2017 level. Uh, and in terms of an EPS, uh, this is $127.60 for 2020, uh, which is uh, down from uh, close to 160 in 2019. Uh, but 2021 is uh, uh, just uh, a little over 159. So if I go to the next slide, Uh, the big growth that we saw uh, in, 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 in 2021, you see in this slide, the 24.8%, uh, we want to get a sense of where this growth is coming from, because a big part of the, uh, of the earnings expectation story in the market is no longer related to what's happening with COVID in 2020. We're looking past that Q4, we're already in Q4, and essentially looking at 2021. Um, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest driver uh, for this 2021 growth is, is pure math of easy comparisons. Uh, in fact, seven of the 16 ZAC sectors uh, will not get to pre-COVID profitability levels in 2021. And with, what are those, uh, those sectors? Uh, it includes as major of a sector as finance. Uh, uh, by the end of uh, 2021, based on today's expectations for 2021, uh, finance earnings will still be 13.3% below pre-COVID profitability level, and I'm using 2019 uh, as, a, uh, as a proxy for, for the, uh, the pre-COVID world. Energy will be about half that level. Transportation, 38%. Discretionary, 33%. And autos, 23%. And the best way to look at this, uh, this picture of expectation is to tie it to what John Blank was explaining uh, as the investment opportunity and the trading opportunity in the current COVID world, uh, uh, that how the vaccine story unfolds, how the recovery story unfolds, uh, will have the biggest bearing uh, on these COVID and social distancing victim sectors. Um, uh, as I explained here, technology, medical, retail, construction, uh, they are the genuine growth drivers. Uh, uh, they, uh, they have uh, impressive growth. As, in, as an example, uh, I've, uh, I've shown visually uh, the tech sector growth picture 
2019 and 2020 are essentially flat. You could see here uh, that the COVID impact on tech um, uh, is, 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 is not that much. Uh, in fact, uh, if you take out a couple of the mega players, Apple, for example, and also uh, a, a couple of the semiconductors, tech is essentially flat uh, on a year-over-year -year basis uh, in 2020, uh, notwithstanding all the COVID disruptions. And this is one of the fundamental reasons why the market has gravitated as much to the technology sector. But as you look ahead to 2021, there is some real genuine profitability growth coming uh, from this sector. If we take this earnings view now on a more granular quarterly basis, we are going through the Q3 reporting cycle right now. I have highlighted uh, what the current ZEX consensus expectations bottom-up aggregated to the index level shows here. Uh, a 19.3% decline, 2.5% decline for revenues look back to where we came from uh, uh, both of the uh, the uh, two quarters in the first half were big decliners particularly the june quarter and as you look ahead you start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on the earning side uh, if you if you dig a little deeper as to what's happening with q3 expectations uh, this is a continuation of the trend that we saw in the June quarter, uh, but a little bit uh, less severe. So 10 of the 16 sectors are double-digit decliners. Transportation and energy are losing money. Uh, we had four sectors lose money uh, in, uh, in the June quarter. Uh, we have been seeing bank results. Uh, they are, uh, by and large, have been very good. And uh, those uh, positive bank results have helped bring down the Q3 decline rate for the finance sector. Uh, please note that the major banks industry, uh, which includes the money center banks and also the big brokers, bring in almost 40% of the finance sector's earnings. So even though we have just a, a dozen or so uh, these big companies, uh, they really have uh, the uh, the weightage uh, to move the needle for the sector. Tech earnings in Q3 are expected to be down 4.2%. Uh, but as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, that's purely uh, because of uh, uh, what is expected for uh, uh, for, for for Apple uh, and uh, and Intel. I moved ahead a little bit on the slides. Uh, other big decliners are the uh, the traditional cyclicals, industrials, materials, autos, discretionary conglomerates, aerospace. These are all the areas whose businesses uh, uh, have been directly hit. Uh, construction, uh, we all hear about the construction and medical are the two sectors. Uh, that have positive earnings growth uh, this quarter. So here is the summary view. Uh, these are the ZEX sectors, not the official standard and poor's gigs. Uh, as you guys know, we have 16 sectors uh, versus the 11 for them. The third row from the bottom gives you the aggregate view uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the index as a whole. I have compared the earnings, revenues, and margins expectations for each sector. 19.3% uh, decline in earnings, 2.5% decline in revenues, uh, and almost 210 basis point squeeze uh, uh, in margin. So as we look ahead, uh, I mentioned earlier how the outlook started improving from mid-year onwards, which resulted 
as in a significant improvement in estimates for full year 2020 uh, and also uh, Q3 uh, 2020. Uh, the key thing we will be monitoring is as we get into the heart of the Q3 earnings season as to how management teams describe the recovery unfolding and the effect that has had on underlying business trends in their spaces, that will have a direct impact on estimates and we will be seeing the effect of that in estimates for 2020 Q4. As we stand today, the expectation is for a 12.8% decline. Uh, my sense is that the market is expecting a continuation of the improving trend we saw since the beginning of July continue in these estimates and also in estimates for 2021 we showed you earlier. Uh, and this will be uh, the key earnings question mark for the market beyond the many other questions uh, that John Blank shared with us earlier. Uh, that's the uh, full extent of uh, the, the summary you I wanted to share with you guys uh, this uh, morning. I, I'm back now. <laughs> My line seems to be working again. I apologize for that uh, interruption. Um, Shiraz, do you see bifurcation among companies reporting earnings? In other words, those expect, uh, exposed to consumer sectors impacted by lockdowns being hurt while those that are not are doing okay? Sure, there is. Uh, uh, some of the, uh, the more social, the directly affected social distancing uh, uh, sectors and spaces, we all understand why the numbers for them are as ugly as they are. Uh, in recent days, we have seen numbers from some of the airlines and they are outright atrocious. Uh, some have turned out to be better than expected. So uh, on the earnings calls, the banks mentioned that the, uh, the, 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 the credit card portfolios uh, have, have fared a lot better uh, than what uh, even they were discussing and sharing with us on the June quarter earnings calls. Uh, so we'll see as the rest of this earnings season unfolds, uh, but by and large, the consumer and households appear to be in good shape. And uh, companies that have a, a business model that they could turn quickly uh, to operate uh, efficiently and profitably in these uncertain times, uh, they have done uh, significantly better uh, relative to those who are just waiting for normalcy to return. So just to give you a quick example, Nike, uh, a very consumer-centric company, uh, had impressive numbers uh, despite its business being so exposed to all of the negative cross currents, primarily because it was able to implement in three months what they had planned to do in two years on its direct-to-consumer and digital sales strategy. Okay, and uh, because I don't know what the phone company is doing with my landline today, I'm going to say with that, we're going to wrap up another call. Thanks to our panelists, John Blank and Shiraz Mian, and we hope you found their presentations informative and helpful. If you'd like copies of John's or Shiraz PowerPoint presentations featured in today's call, please email zrs at zax.com. Contact your ZRS representative directly, or you can even access them in the GoToWebinar console. And if you have any questions regarding our services, feel free to email them to zrs at zax.com. Meantime, we hope everyone is doing as well as they can during this continued challenging time. Everyone here at Zax is doing what we can to service each of you during this time, and uh, we're knowing that we're all working remotely, but um, we are doing our best. So thank you for your understanding. And as always, we look forward to the next time we are all together on the call.